Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Friday Night Live. So this week, I'm going to be talking about moderation. I thought I'd move away from the kind of generic chit chat um, and try and cover off topics. So this will be the first one. <clears throat> and as I say, I'll be talking about moderation. Before I get started in the nitty gritty of this, I wanted just to talk about the, the life cycle of addiction. OK, because if we run it through right through to stopping, it's quite interesting because it starts off, obviously, experimenting. So nobody's addicted to drugs before they take them. So we start off with these things. We're interested. We, you know, our friends are doing them. Our grown ups are doing them. We kind of we want to know about them. So we start taking them. Um, and over time, we learn to enjoy them more and more to such an extent that eventually they become a necessity. Um, and as that continues and continues to take a hold, it becomes a problem. And then as the problem grows worse, we are eventually forced to accept that it's a problem. And note there that chronologically, the problem kicks in way before we finally accept it's a problem. Because with all drug addiction, what, however much we hate the drug, we're also very afraid of living our lives without it. Um, so, oh, how can I possibly go on holiday and enjoy myself? How can I enjoy Christmas and nights out and all the rest of it without my drug? OK, so we don't want it to be a problem. So we put off accepting it's a problem. When we finally do accept it, that it's a problem, we don't automatically or very few people automatically make the attempt to quit. What they usually do is try to moderate. They try to cut down. They will have memories of when they started that they could take it or leave it. And a lot of people believe that's habit. OK, so they think back to a time when they drank a lot less or smoked a lot less or whatever it might be. And they will try to moderate. They'll try to control it. Um, and most of the time, for what for reasons I'm about to cover off, that's not successful. And they're then forced to stop. A lot of people consider the moderation stage the most heartbreaking. Um, because that's the time where people are constantly trying and failing and it's deeply unpleasant. Um, so from my perspective, I think if you can explain it and understand it, it is a stage for most people that you have to go through in order to quit. And if you understand it properly, I think you can get through it a lot quicker. Um, as everything with addiction, I think the starting point is the chemical and physiological side of things. So that's what I'm going to start talking about. So this is almost the bread and butter of it. Um, so alcohol is a sedative. It's a depressant. Um, and when I use the word depressant, I'm using it in its chemical sense as something that decreases or inhibits nerve activity. It's like an anesthetic. Um, but the human brain is not passive. It's reactive um, and it reacts to our environment it also reacts to what we put inside ourselves so the human brain has its own huge array of chemicals drugs and hormones um, and we, we humans don't even fully understand how these will work together or we, we don't even have a full list of them let alone do we understand how they all interact with one another and balance one another but what we do know is the human brain works by way of something called homeostasis which is this delicate chemical balancing act of all these chemicals drugs and hormones so when you introduce something like alcohol which is a sedative or a depressant your brain reacts to it and it does that in lots of different ways it releases things like adrenaline and cortisol which is a stress hormone which counters the sedating effects of the alcohol what it's trying to do is trying to redress the sedating effects of the alcohol trying to redress the balance so when the alcohol finally wears off, there is a corresponding feeling of anxiety. It's that tension, that unpleasant feeling that you get when an alcoholic drink wears off. Um, and that really is the backbone of the chemical side of addiction to alcohol. When the alcohol wears off, it leaves that chemical imbalance, which manifests as kind of an unpleasant, uptight feeling. And you need another drink to get rid of it. Um, there's a few points to note here. When you first start drinking, now if you only ever have a glass of wine, that's a fairly small amount of alcohol. And the withdrawal, because it is the withdrawal, that unpleasant feeling you get from it um, is almost negligible. It's very, very hard to discern. And a lot of people won't even realize they have it. They have it. The brain becomes more and more proficient as time passes at countering the sedating effects of the alcohol. The knock on effect of that is one, we're able to drink more. 
Um, two, we want to drink more. We need to drink more to get the same effect. But most importantly, when the alcohol wears off, that feeling of anxiety of, is worse. If you have a glass of wine, your brain only has to re release a very small amount of stimulants to counter it. And so when the alcohol wears off, it's almost unnoticeable. But if you're drinking a bottle or two bottles of wine, it's a much more pronounced feeling. It's much more unpleasant. That's why a lot of drinkers find they wake up at three, four in the morning. It's that stimulating effect. It's that overstimulation that kicks in. Um, so where does that take us? The point here is that if you are used to drinking, say, a bottle of wine every night and you suddenly cut down to one glass, your brain will not realize that you are suddenly drinking less and it will it will release stimulants to counter that bottle of wine. So you have one glass of wine, but your brain releases stimulants to counter an entire bottle. OK, so there's a very, very simple reason. And this isn't just true of alcohol. It's true of any drug. Um, it's very easy to maintain your dose or increase it. It's incredibly difficult to reduce it because we don't want to feel tense and unpleasant and anxious. Sorry, I'm just going to put the air conditioning on. It's slightly warm here in London today. Um, there we go. So we don't want to feel tense and nervous and unhappy. We want to feel relaxed and confident and good. Um, so the tendency is to want to keep drinking. OK, and as I say, that tendency just increases and increases as time passes. It's very, very easy to increase and maintain a dose it's very very difficult to decrease it okay so if you are currently drinking two bottles of wine a night and you think oh i should cut down to a glass that glass is just going to make you feel awful because you'll feel really tense because the brain is releasing stimulants to counter two bottles okay um the problem as well with it is th 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 this is what sometimes happens so if you are drinking quite heavily and you suddenly stop and you find you can't sleep at all you're awake all night that's the reason um, <clears throat> so it is incredibly difficult to cut back on. Um, there is another aspect here, which is, um, the fact that, so the key really with addiction is it's not just that unpleasant feeling. So addiction isn't just the chemical, there's a psychological aspect to it as well. So, Everybody who has an alcoholic drink gets a feeling of relaxation followed by a corresponding feeling of anxiety, okay? That doesn't necessarily mean they are addicted or alcohol dependent. How that kicks in, that's a psychological process because whenever an alcoholic drink wears off, it leaves, alcohol leaves our system leaving that unpleasant feeling. But of course, there's lots of reasons in life why we might feel unpleasant. Most of the time, we just get on with things. So we can go for years <clears throat> drinking and feeling unpleasant afterwards and just getting on with it. But the problem is with repeated doses of alcohol, what your brain starts to learn is a very, very valuable lesson. And that is when that unpleasant feeling kicks in, another alcoholic or alcoholic drink will relieve it. OK, because if you think the, the unpleasant feeling is caused by a chemical imbalance, your brain's geared up to work under the sedating effects of the alcohol, but the alcohol's gone. So it's racing ahead and you're feeling really anxious and uptight. If you have an, another alcoholic drink, you immediately balance that. So you immediately feel better. And over the years, your brain starts to learn that. <clears throat> and what it does is it interprets that unpleasant feeling as I want another drink. OK, this is learned behavior and it can take people years or even decades to finally learn these lessons. But when they do learn it on a subconscious level, every drink causes a desire for the next one, because as one alcoholic drink wears off, it leaves an unpleasant, tense feeling that your brain interprets as I want another drink. <clears throat> The problem with that is it wants it now. It doesn't want it next week or in half an hour or in an hour or whenever it is your rules that you've set up about moderation will allow you to have one. You want it now. Um, so it becomes incredibly difficult to say no to. When you're past that stage, you can't ever go back. It's learned behavior. OK, and this is why I often say there is a take it and leave it phase with every single drug. But it is once and once only. 
because the take it and leave it phase, all it means is that you have your subconscious hasn't cottoned onto the fact that another dose of the drug will relieve the unpleasant feeling that kicks in when the previous dose wears off. And that's true of heroin. It's true of cigarettes. It's true of cocaine. It's true of, true of crystal meth. It's true of everything. The timings differ for various reasons, um, primarily by how long, it, how quickly the drug gets into your bloodstream. The quicker you, you, the drug gets into your bloodstream and you experience the effects of it, the quicker your subconscious cottons onto it. So injecting, snorting and inhaling gets the drug into your bloodstream almost immediately. Drinking it takes about 20 minutes, half an hour to get into your bloodstream, depending on whether you've eaten or not. <clears throat> But because of that long tail between the drink and the effect, alcohol can take years and years to become addicted to, as opposed to drugs that you snort, inject or inhale. OK, like heroin, cocaine um, and nicotine. OK, that's the only difference. The actual chemical itself is just as addictive as, as all those other things. Um, so. It's not like food. This is the key point with moderation. It's not like eating. You know, if you are hungry and you want something and you eat enough of it, it makes you feel sick and you don't want any more. That will never happen with alcohol because no matter how many drinks you have, when they wear off, you will have an unpleasant feeling and you will want to take another one to get rid of it. Um, this is kind of I've sort of um, gone through now the physiological side of it, but I think there's an awful lot to say on the psychological side of it as well. And one of the most important things to talk about in this aspect is craving. So I've spoken about cravings many, many times, but I will go through them again now. A lot of people think cravings are just something that it's like a bolt out of the blue. It suddenly hits you and you just have to suffer from them. They're a conscious thought process. What happens is the thought of, let's, let's talk about craving for alcohol because this is what the talk is about. The thought of an alcoholic drink enters your mind and it's what happens at that point will determine whether you have a craving or not. If you start thinking to yourself, oh, wow, a drink would be so nice. And you start working through in your mind and fantasizing about it and obsessing about it, you will be craving. And that's what a craving is. It's when you're obsessing about having something, you're fantasizing about how great it will be. OK, that's what a craving is. Um I think about alcohol, I don't know, 80 percent of my waking hours and I never, ever crave a drink because I never fantasize about it. One of the key points with craving is certainty, okay? If you know you are not going to have a drink, come what may, it's just not going to happen, you're far less likely to crave because craving is all about fantasizing and teasing yourself with the thought of having something. If you know you are not going to drink, you are less likely to crave, okay? Because, so for example, I think about alcohol, I don't for a moment think, oh, I really want to drink. I just think of it on an academic level. So I never, ever crave alcohol. Um, certainty then can be key in kicking cravings into touch. When you allow the possibility of having a drink, no matter on what occasion, you will be craving an awful lot more because that possibility is always there. Um, there's another point here in that sobriety is about basically learning new skills. It's about teaching yourself a different reaction to things. So as I said, my reaction to alcohol is never, oh, that would be really nice. Should I have one and start teasing myself? I just, that never happens to me. It didn't happen that way immediately. It took time and it took effort. But like a lot of things, you know, when you want to change your behavior, firstly, it's conscious. You have to be consciously, constantly thinking about it. And no, I can't do this. Or yes, I must do that. But over time, it becomes easier and easier. And it, eventually it just becomes instinctive. So I now have an instinctive reaction to alcohol. And that is what foul rubbish. I can't believe so many people are conned into drinking it. That's my instinctive reaction. OK, but when on some occasions you're having it and some occasions you aren't, you can never learn that instinctive reaction. OK, you could, because you're constantly having to approach it with a conscious decision. Do I drink in this occasion or do I not? So you never learn that instinctive. I don't want to drink. Um, there's another thing with moderation, which is it is a catch 22. Right. 
the reason I'm free of alcohol is because I do not want it anymore under any circumstances. Okay. So I don't want to moderate. If I wanted to moderate, it would mean I still wanted to drink, which would mean it was inherently problematic for me to try it. Um, to put it another way, so so the thing that drags us in and causes us a problem with drinking is all our beliefs about it. So we, we believe we can't enjoy life without it. You know, oh, I can't possibly go on holiday and enjoy myself without a drink, you know, because lying around on the beach eating loads of nice food isn't enjoyable enough. You know, I, I, I won't be happy unless I have a drink. Um, I can't possibly enjoy Christmas without a drink. How will I relax after? You know, it's all these beliefs. You believe you need it in these circumstances. And that's why it's incredibly hard to give up without changing these beliefs. Um, moderation buys into the very myths that cause alcohol to be a problem in the first place. You know, you moderate because why would you even want to moderate? Because you believe alcohol does enhance social situations, that it does help you relax that you do need it to enjoy a holiday. So you can't quite bear to give it up. So you're kind of buying into all these myths, which cause the problem in the first place. And I think most importantly, the biggest myth is it's not addictive because I've just explained how it is addictive. But why would you moderate something that's addictive? You can't. By its very nature, addiction is not about moderation it's about having to have something whether you want it or not you know you wouldn't try and moderate cocaine or heroin or crystal meth or, or even nicotine you know because it can't be done it's addictive um, and when you cross that line between one dose wearing off and you wanting the next dose that's where the problem comes in um so to even say you want to moderate is buying into the biggest myth of all that alcohol isn't addictive which of course it is and it's still not addressing the main issue which is why we want to drink in the first place um so i've got a question here do you think anyone can become a take it or leave it drinker after a period of abstinence and years no because as i say with repeated consumption of alcohol what your brain learns is oh, there's an unpleasant feeling that kicks in when one drink wears off and I know just how to get rid of that and that's to have another drink. So that's the voice in your head saying, have another drink, have another drink, have another drink. You can't unlearn that because it's true, okay? It is true. Another drink will make you feel better. And when you've gone through that learning process, you can't ever unlearn it. Imagine if you never come across the concept of maths. I could quite easily teach you numbers up to four or five and teach you how two plus two is four. When I've taught you that, I can never unteach you. Okay, you've got that knowledge forever and it can never be lost. That's the same with addiction. That is what you where you've got to with addiction. If you have a problem with alcohol, it's because your brain equates the unpleasant feeling that wears off, um, that kicks in when one drink wears off with taking another drink to get rid of it. Um, I've had a couple, I don't know if there's any more questions from people watching, but I've had another a few questions that have um, been put in to the various um, social media um, platforms. So I'll start on that. Oh, here we've got another question here. 19 months with one data point, And that was just recently just to see what one glass of champagne would do. I couldn't have done this without your books, Mr. Porter. Thank you. Well, well done. That's brilliant. And and I suppose this as well is exactly the point. Um and I suppose another one, because this is another issue with moderation, is that like drinking, it's the idea and not the reality that pulls us in. OK, so let me explain that. When we think about moderation, OK, what we're thinking about is, you know, having a glass of champagne at a wedding and really enjoying it and it making you feel really good and then putting the glass down and just forgetting about it and not wanting another one um, and then just not even thinking about drinking for weeks on end and then picking up and maybe having a couple of glasses of wine at Christmas and really enjoying it and you know sipping it and it's all very relaxed and calm that's what we think of moderation the reality isn't that the reality is obsessing about alcohol as much as you ever did, but maybe drinking less. And this is this is the best case. This, if you can make it worse, is the best you can hope for. 
you will be obsessing about it all the time, but you just won't be satisfying that desire all the time. You will just be living in a situation of constantly wanting something you can't have. And the problem is it just takes a bad day or, you know, you're at the end of your tether and you just go right off the rails again. Um, I'll read some of the questions now and start working through those. Um, let's just check the time. Yeah, okay. So I have a moderation question. My position was that I was a daily drinker, usually around 35 to 40 units a week. So definitely heavy drinker, but I did not drink to clear a hangover. So I guess two on the scale you've outlined previously. I'm not sure what, that's, what that scale is, but never, never mind. So now I'm thinking about giving up completely because I'm fed up of being stuck in a loop of guilt and feeling tired. However, there is voice in my head wondering if I could give up my daily drinking. Could I go back to having a drink on special occasions, e.g. a few glasses of wine at Christmas or on holiday or birthday, etc.? If I was to have a trial period of moderation, what would be a sensible way of going about it? So I, I don't think there really is a sensible way of going about it. I, I'm not here to tell you what to do. OK, I'm just here to give you my view um, and to back it up insofar as I can with the science um, and also to tell you my experiences. It's entirely up to you what you do. What I suggest. So you've said a few glasses of wine at Christmas, holiday and birthday. Right. So you will be drinking three times a year. Um, and are you telling me then you'll be happy to go out on a night out with work people and just not drink? or go out on, I don't know, um, you know, you have a bad day at work and you're not going to drink. Because for me, stopping drinking was about learning to live, deal with stress, socialise, go on holiday, Christmas, all of it without drinking. And when you start doing that, you start to realise, hang on, I'm really enjoying myself. I didn't need alcohol in the first place. And the more you do that, the more you repeat it, the stronger your sobriety comes. Try it and see how you get on and do feel free to contact me. But what I think will probably happen is your few glasses of wine at Christmas, holiday or birthday will morph into much, much more regular drinking. A lot of people say, well, just socialising so that it becomes weekends. But actually drinking two, two out of five days um, and certainly see how you go about it. But what I suspect will happen is you'll then have occasions where you're um, socialising during the week, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and pretty soon you'll be right back to where you started for the reasons previously outlined. Giving up drinking is incredibly liberating. If you just give it up and have done with it, you get that certainty. You're not going to do it again come what may. You don't sit there agonising over to whether to have a drink or not because you're not going to have one. But if you allow that possibility, that's where the problems come in. Um, I've got some more questions in the chat. Hi, William. One question. I was a daily heavy evening drinker, but on rare occasion, I would have a glass of wine at lunchtime. I was OK to stop. Do you think do you think that belief based? It could be. I don't know enough about you, but if you're at work when you have a drink at lunchtime, you can sometimes manage it quite easily. And this really proves the whole point about craving being a conscious thought process because you have a glass at lunchtime and then you go back to work and this needs doing and that needs doing and you're working and you're busy and all the rest of it and you're not thinking about drinking. Um, I doubt very much you would have one at lunchtime and not drink all afternoon if you were sat in the pub or bar with your friends all afternoon. Um, I would think then you would probably just carry on. So I think that's more to do with kind of showing how um, – you can, you know, if, you, if you've if you got a busy afternoon or even at work, you know, if you're just like a, at home or something, but you've got things to do, you've got your usual routine to go through and you're going through it and your thoughts taken up with that, you know, that unpleasant feeling may well kick in, but you might not be agonising over to whether, whether or not to have another drink to get rid of it because you're busy doing other things. Um, I think the people who really buy into the harmless idea of alcohol are the people who keep their consumption to no more than one to two glasses at a time. I'm not entirely clear. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair comment. I'm not entirely clear. That's that's true. I, I mean, I know a lot of people who have one or two glasses um, and want to stop those one or two glasses and find it difficult. So it's it's a problem. It's not a, as much of a problem as, you know, the homeless person knocking back eight cans of special brew. Um, but it's still a problem in that they want to stop and they struggle with doing it. Um, I'll move on to the next question here. 
Uh, my husband doesn't drink at all. He gets too sleepy. Started back at university in, aer in aeronautical or engineering and flying planes. He has to be up by 4 a.m., so drinking was out of the question. He has no idea what alcohol addiction means or what moderation means. In fact, he encourages moderation because he wants me to relax with the massive stress I'm going through right now. He's no longer flying planes. He's in cybersecurity, but he's still up at 4 a.m. every single day. He doesn't know what alcohol does to sleep, his most precious asset to manage his demanding work schedule. How can I solidify in his mind that encouraging moderation is harmful to me? I'm already struggling with this. I've tried to explain, but as someone who has never drunk alcohol, he has no desire to. Um, he doesn't get it. Have you had this issue surface before in your group? I can't recall. I don't think it has surfaced before. Um, but I suppose the, the thing to do is <laughs> get him to read the book or watch the live, which I suppose he's too busy to do. Um, and in that case, you just need to sit him down and try and explain it to him. See, this is the problem. People don't have a correct view of alcohol. Um, they think it's generally harmless or in some ways good for you because it helps you relax and sleep, of which it does neither. Um, which is another point with moderation, because going back to what I was talking about before with, you know, moderation reality versus moderation fantasy, i.e. what you know, the idea of moderation that pulls us in compared to the reality when we get there. What a lot of people think with moderation is drink less and get the good without the bad. OK, that is complete and utter rubbish. OK, on the Alcohol Explained um, course on the website, I talk about drag, not as in men dressing up as women, but as in aerodynamics, so something that works against the forward motion of something, basically something that's slowing you down and dragging you back when you're trying to go forwards. Alcohol causes drag, okay, for every single drinker, even someone who has half a glass of red wine once a week, okay? It does it in several ways. I've spoken about sleep a million times. It's in previous lives. It's in the book. It's on the website. I won't go through it again now. Alcohol ruins your sleep. OK, the more you drink, the more it ruins your sleep. But even small amounts will interrupt your normal sleeping cycle. So even your half a glass of red wine once a week drinker is interrupting their normal sleeping pattern and feeling slightly tired as they would the next day than had they not drunk alcohol. OK, the second thing alcohol does is it speeds up your heart rate. Now, when your heart rate speeds up, your brain says to you, stop and slow down. OK, that's why drinkers are lazy and they have no energy, because when your heart rate is up, you just want to sit down and relax. OK, and even half a glass of red wine will put your heart rate up and you'll have slightly less energy than you had otherwise. OK, the other thing it does is it encourages weight gain. Right. And again, there's a whole nother live on this. So I'm not going to talk about it. I've talked, spoken about it many times. Again, it's on the website. It's in the course. It's in the books. There's I, th I think there was something like nine reasons. There's a blog post on it. And I list the nine reasons why alcohol encourages weight gain. And even small amounts of alcohol will make you gain weight. OK, that happens to everyone. So the idea that you can drink a small amount and have the good without the bad is just absolute nonsense everybody has this drag from alcohol. Um, and one of the best feelings is just not to have that anymore. Um, it really is. Right. Let's have a look at some of the other comments. Um, da, 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 giving a, da, da. It's been my experience that moderation makes cravings worse. I was an all or nothing drinker. Do you believe that moderation can make? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I've spoken about that. So cravings, I, I think, in, I can't remember which book it is, Alcohol Explained 2, I break them down into four or five parts. But for the basis of this talk, let's just break them down into two parts. So the thought of an alcoholic drink enters your head. So part one of the craving is you start to fantasize about it and drool over it. Um, and part two of the craving is when you start to tease yourself with the thought of it. So you think, oh, yeah, a nice cold beer that really hit the spot. That made me feel so good. 
I, you know, I could just have one on this occasion. I'll be, you know, start making excuses for yourself. And suddenly you're just obsessing about a drink. You're not enjoying sitting down with your mates or, you know, enjoying the nice meal with your partner or sitting down at the end of the evening watching TV, whatever it might be, because you're taken up in this unpleasant little tantrum in your own mind. Um, and of course, if you have a drink, it doesn't do much of anything apart from feel, make you feel slightly sedated and relieve any withdrawal that it called previously. One of the big things it does is you're not craving it anymore. So you can get on with enjoying your mate's company or to, the meal with your partner or watching TV or whatever it is. So it's it's purely a, a placebo. A big part of it is a placebo. If you know you're not going to drink, like I say, you don't start thinking, ooh, a beer would be nice because you're not going to have one. So you don't waste time thinking about it. And you certainly don't start thinking, oh, I could have one on this occasion because you're not going to have one on this occasion or any other occasion. So that freedom, that kind of relief of just getting rid of it once and for all, that doesn't come from moderation and it can't do. It has to come from stopping entirely. Um, it's hilarious. Everyone keeps calling this a journey. How about hardest thing I've ever tried to do or at least struggle or battle? Sheesh, thanks for educating us and making it look so easy. It, it may not feel this way, but it's a battle if you still want it. OK, you know, if there is something that tastes really good, that helps you bond with human beings, that, you know, puts the icing on the cake on holidays and Christmas and Thanksgiving and without which life is just lackluster and mediocre. Yeah, it's going to be really hard to give it up. You know, it's going to be a battle and a struggle. Um, but if you have something that tastes foul, that makes you feel tired and irritable and out of sorts, um, and just want to keep taking it to feel even worse and worse because each time you take it, it feels slightly better. And actually, you feel a whole world better when you've kicked it into touch. That's going to be pretty easy to give up. Okay. And that's why I'm always talking about changing your beliefs about alcohol. And actually, alcohol is its own worst enemy um, because when you delve under the surface a bit, you realize that so much of the pleasure in it is, is just complete nonsense. Um, I've got it down to once or twice a month and the rest of the time I don't think about it. I'll get blindsided by a sudden massive craving. If I do give in, I just make sure to concentrate on how. So again, start analysing these cravings then because, you know, they are conscious. They do jump in from somewhere and you can counter them because you do not crave something you do not want. Um, and I've said this a few times, but so what I did with alcohol, I, I didn't even do this consciously. I just sort of found myself doing it. The thing I hated most about drinking was those 4 a.m. wake ups, feeling like exhausted, really bone tired, but also kind of really anxious and on edge and unable to get back to sleep. And it was just horrible, particularly because we had young kids at the time. They were like a year and 18 months or something. So just not, never getting enough sleep, always tired. And I'd be lying there thinking, why can't I sleep? I should be asleep now. Precious moments to sleep and I can't sleep. Um, and that is the, that is the reality of drinking. <laughs> that is That happens to everyone when they drink. So when I started looking at an alcoholic drink, I would just think, do you want to lie awake at 4am? Because that's where that's going to lead. And that's what I started to do. And now when I look at alcohol, I don't buy into the illusion. I see the reality, that 4am wake up. Um, much I hate it alone with no distractions and then back on the path the next day. I know it's still failure, but I'm still trying. One day I will get 100% right. Like you, thank you for everything. Keep trying, but keep analysing, okay? Don't ever take it for granted. And the really important thing to do, when you are craving it and you haven't drunk for a while, drink it alone, no music, no nothing. No, don't be out with friends. If you know, if it's a night out with friends, go home. If you determine, you know, if you're out, you think, well, I'm going to go out and stay sober. You suddenly think, I can't handle this. I'm going to drink. Go home and drink on your own. Okay. No music, no TV, no nothing. And really concentrate on it because I break it down to the, you know, the physical, the chemical feeling, the cravings, your removal of the cravings. Start to do that in your own mind. OK, you can't do it when you're out with mates all talking and laughing anyway. You need to be somewhere really quiet, start analysing it because you will start to buy in to this rea this new reality, the true reality of drinking. Um, and for a lot of people, that's the key to freedom. Um, 
gave up alcohol and started working out. That's what a lot of people do. The good thing with that is it's a it's a good coping mechanism. So you have a bad day and you don't drink anymore. What do you do? Well, go for a run, go for a walk, go to the gym. Um, once we stop drinking, it isn't a battle. Yeah, absolutely. It's a journey because our lives change for the better. We find a path to self-discovery and improvement in so many ways in our lives. Excellent. Yeah, but that's exactly it. I think I've got a couple more questions now on the, um, in fact, no, last one. Yes. Page 46, Alcohol Explained 2. The problem is that when we start drinking again, we return to the reality of drinking and not the idolized fantasy. What we return to is not the paradise we've been pining for, but the living hell we wanted to escape, escape from in the first place. The fantasy evaporates and reality comes crashing back in. Our drinking moves from the I don't have it into the I have it category. All of this may happen while drinking that first drink, or it may take a few hours or even days, but it will happen. Pretty soon we're right back to where we started, which is doing something we hate and desperately looking for a way to quit. And so the process continues. This sums it up perfectly for me. I've been through this cycle countless times in my 25 plus year relationship with alcohol. It was only after reading Alcohol Explained 1 and 2 that my eyes were open to conditions such as ambition and fading effect bias. Now I'm able to shut the urges down before they morph into cravings. Brilliant. Well done. So after all of that being said, is it normal if I don't want to try to moderate or go back to my binge drinking lifestyle to still get that momentarily to still get that momentary thought of an alcoholic beverage on that hot summer day or after a long hectic day at work i think it's completely normal and in fact to be expected because not only did you spend 25 plus years drinking you me and everyone else who stopped drinking are still surrounded by the 87 percent of population who are sheeps and still doing it still banging their head against the brick wall um, so, and they're all selling it to you because they want to believe it themselves that, oh, it's really nice and it's, oh, it's really relaxing. So absolutely, it would be a miracle if you didn't sometimes get that idolized fantasy in your mind. The important thing is you're not going to drink and you're not letting it turn into a craving. So that's the key. The thought is entering your mind, but you're not dwelling on it and fantasizing about it and teasing yourself with it. And that really is the key. That's what I'm talking about, that thought process between alcohol entering your, into your mind and what do you do with it? You've got a path then. Do you start craving it? Do you start fantasizing and teasing? Or do you start thinking, waking up at 4 a.m., Christ, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore. Um, did, did, uh, that's, oh, yeah, so someone said that's what I did with that one drink a couple of weeks ago made it uneventful as possible yeah that's exactly it because what you're doing then you're actually drilling down to what the alcohol is um i'm not sure if anyone's got any other questions because i've dealt with all the ones that were there and i think i've done all the comments um i'll sum up and if anyone has any final questions then put them in but i think the key here is there's an inherent problem with moderation one is the chemical because alcohol wears off and it causes a desire for the next drink. OK, so it's always, you know, when you've crossed that line, it's always going to be inherently problematic. OK, secondly, to even want to try moderation, you've still got to be laboring under the myths that were really the bars to your prison in the first place, i.e. it's pleasurable I have to have it to enjoy life. I have to have it to cope with life. I cannot live my life without it. That's what it comes down to. If you want to moderate, you still believe that you cannot live your life without drinking. Okay. And that is the exact myth that you're trying to get rid of. You know, it's that thing, you know, and I think I mentioned this in one of my blog posts, but I once had flu and I took night nurse I was like, oh, that's <laughs> unfamiliar and foul tang to it. And sure enough, it's 20% alcohol. It was the equivalent of drinking a small glass of port. OK, that didn't lead me to drinking again because I absolutely had no intention of ever doing it. I didn't want to drink. So I actually had an alcoholic drink and it didn't lead anywhere. So theoretically, I could moderate because I did it on that one occasion. I had one and it wasn't a problem. I didn't have any more. But it was only not a problem because I have absolutely no desire to drink. And that's why, to me, it is a catch-22 situation on so many different levels. Because if you even want to do it, you shouldn't be doing it because you're still labouring under those misapprehensions. Um, 
so excellent i hope that was useful for everyone um i will see you soon and um have a good weekend everyone bye